and uh, especially parents, young married couples, teenagers. As I discuss something that I did not want to discuss, but I feel must be done. And this is a pastoral kind of message tonight. I'm not preaching tonight to scold homosexuals, lesbians, and so forth. Though, by the way, uh, I, I think it's a wicked, vile thing to do. But I want to alert parents and, and young people of something that is a serious problem. Not only in the world, but in our churches. And I want to try to help you to overcome or to prevent the problem. You know, of all the things that... I want to chat with you for a minute before I start uh, my message. Of all the things that I guess I could wish that you'd never indulge, homosexuality would be one of the greatest. Every teenager here knows that Brother Hiles wants you to save yourself or the young man or young lady that God has for you. Every person here tonight knows that I do not believe in, in just being promiscuous and giving yourself away to someone that's not, uh, the one that not, God has not chosen for you. I want you to have, you know what I believe about that. No, nobody wonders my position on what I want for our young folks. But you know, <clears throat> the woman at the well could be could have a happy life in the future. But once you go into the sin of homosexuality, your chances of normalcy and having a happy life in the future are just about nil. I've been in this business a long time. I can say that I have seen fewer homosexuals saved than any other group of people about whom I know. Now, as pastor, I'm talking to my own people tonight, and I, because I know some things that are going on. Now, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, by the way, uh, <coughs> preaching because of something that's happened recently. Though I, I do know of people in this room tonight who admittedly are guilty of homosexuality, lesbianism, and so forth. I know that. You're here. You sat in my office. You told me. I have compassion for you. I want to help you. And, and, and in some cases, I, the Lord has been able, with some good common sense, to rescue some people from the sins of homosexuality. But it's getting out of bounds. And it is. And may I say this? It could happen to your child. It could happen to your child. The best parent in this service tonight, it could happen to your child. And let me say this, just getting the child saved does not cure him from being a homosexual and does not prevent him from being a homosexual. Girls, on the front. I want you to hear what I have to say. And I want to help you, and I can't help you if you're talking. I don't, I don't intend for you to talk while I'm preaching tonight. Now, it's getting out of bounds. It's not a coincidence that males are wearing their hair long, wearing makeup, earrings, other kind of female jewelry. It's not a coincidence that, that males are wearing clothing like females. It's not a coincidence that Females are wearing their hair cut like men, men's clothing. I have an article in my pocket now. Someone gave me a while ago on the unisex. unisex. That's the thing that, that America is headed for, and that's the thing that many people are pointing to and centering their attention upon is the unisex, one sex society. In the Kinsey Report, which, by the way, was made years ago, in the famous Kinsey Report, Mr. Kinsey said that 4% of our males over 16 years of age are homosexuals. Now, think about that for a minute. 4% of our males over 16 years of age. Now, by the way, <coughs> the percentage would not necessarily be greater outside the church than inside the church. 
To be quite frank with you, I would not be surprised the percentage is not greater inside the church, for a homosexual can find his refuge and haven inside a church, for he's not usually a rugged enough person to... Well, it's easy for homosexuals to enter the ministry, for example. So, um, Mr. Ken, now, let's think about that. If we have a thousand teenagers on our Sunday school role, we do, and if half of those teenagers are 16 and over, that's 500. And if half of those are males, that's 250. And if we have 2,000 men in our church, and I feel sure we do, that's probably, we probably have, I would, I would imagine on our church roles, we have 2,500 people who are male and 16 or over. Now, that's 2,500, if our church is a typical cross-section as far as, as uh, homosexuality is concerned, that's four times 25, which means we would have, if we're average, a hundred homosexuals on our church roll. Now, I could point tonight, and I wouldn't, and I'm sure you're pleased that I won't. I could point to a half a dozen right here in this room. Now, I mean, that have told me. I, I, I'm sure there are others, but I, I can point to that many who've told me. I could point to at least three females who have told me that they're guilty. And I'm, when I say homosexuality tonight, I'm lumping together all, both uh, men with men and, and women with women. Now, I know there, there are more technical terms for the ladies and so forth, but I, I, uh, I'm lumping it all together. I know of at least three women in this house tonight who have come to my office and told me they're guilty of homosexuality. At least a half a dozen males in this house tonight who have told me. Now, there are others who have almost told me, which means that in, in a church like this, we, we, we have them who come. In um, California, there's a church, I've mentioned it to you, uh, an Assembly of God preacher who became, who was a homosexual, married, by the way, and by the way, many homosexuals do marry, and many homosexuals have children. But their, their strongest tendency is toward men, toward men, and so forth. But um, anyway, in California, this uh, Assembly of God preacher... Uh, he was found to be a homosexual. So he has founded a church for homosexuals and publicly announces that the church is basically for homosexuals. Now, heterosexual people or normal people may come to the church, but it is founded for the refuge of homosexual people. That's in California, and it's been in our national magazines and syndicated columns. They now have, in, uh, in our larger cities, clubs with regular periodic meetings, where homosexuals can come and meet and, and get together and have club meetings. In Chicago, there are numbers of homosexual men who live with other men. And when I say men, you understand that I detest using the word men, but I'm using it just to let you know they're, they're males or, or supposed to be. Uh, these men marry men. Right over here in Chicago, I have in my files the, the meeting places, the places where they meet, and a few of the names in my files, I wouldn't, I don't have them with me. But um, one man will, will be the one who makes the living, and the other will stay at home and cook and keep house. And they live together as homosexuals, setting up housekeeping and so forth. They call this the gay community. The gay community, it'll surprise some of you to know, that they have their own bars. There are bars in Chicago operated by homosexuals, far homosexuals, and these are all across the country. The gay or homosexual community has its own beaches operated by homosexuals where men can lie on beaches and commit homosexuality with men on beaches. The gay community has its own restaurants operated by homosexuals, uh, basically for homosexuals, and the homosexuals know where these restaurants are. One of our young men in our church uh, became a homosexual or was a homosexual. He came to my office and told me all these things. He said, I can tell you, I can go tonight to this restaurant and this restaurant and this restaurant. And he said, I can, I can tell you that 90% of the customers there will be homosexuals. That's where we meet each other. The gay community includes not only bars, beaches, restaurants, but barbershops. This young man told me that there are barbershops in Chicago. And he even said some in, uh, he thought, in the Academy region operated by homosexuals, appealing to homosexuals and catering to their business. The gay community has their own tailors, their own gymnasiums, their own apartment houses. Did you know their apartment houses in most of the big cities in this country that try as best they can to rent only to homosexuals? 
having their own gay community in one apartment house. I'm sure the day will come, uh, if we continue our present folly, where we'll bus homosexuals to different neighborhood schools so we can have a proper proportion of homosexuals as we do in other cases. And that's supposed to be funny. Ridiculously so. Um, but um, so they, the gay community, uh, they have their own books, their own magazines. Did you know that I can take you to airports in America by the dozens and uh, stands all over Chicago and all over any big city in America? Where you can find books. Now, the, the, the male Playboy magazine, boys, listen to me, that exposes the male body so that male homosexuals can come and uh, buy these sordid books and their legal books have been declared by our courts as, as legal and non-pornographic. Did you know in many of our cities <coughs> they have uh, little uh, booths, little recreation rooms? where men can go and put money in a slot and see movies of men committing homosexual acts with men in many of our cities. Um, their own magazines, their own, uh, they have their own conventions. The Jew of the homosexuals have conventions. Uh, the, um, they have their own call boys. I travel a great deal. And I know something about what's going on. You'd be surprised. You'd be surprised the time, the phone calls I get within 30 minutes after I check into some hotels and motels across this country. Many, many times, many, many times, when I get to a motel, there is a card with a telephone, and it says, for any service you'd like, call. And what they'll do, they'll provide a man with either a woman or a man, whichever he wants. Now, I know what I'm talking about. I've had bellboys um, to, to come to my room as soon as I got checked in. I've had the bellboy that took my bags before he sat, before he left, to tell me, ask me what I wanted. I know our hotels and motels are cesspools of filth. Now, that is not to say that every hotel, every motel is a cesspool of filth. But I know. I've, I've had it. I know. I have seen men in hotels whom I knew to be men looking for men who wanted other men. And that's their job. Call boys for men, just like call girls. Did you know the gay community has male prostitutes? Yes. Houses of male prostitution in m most of our cities where men can find other homosexuals, go to their houses, just like female prostitutes, and uh, buy wicked acts from other males. Now, that's what we face. Now, the sad and tragic thing is this. Did you know that most of our leading denominations, liberal denominations, have come out openly recommending acceptance of homosexuals as normal citizens and not condemning them for their practices? The Wolfenden report said this. Homosexuality between adults in private should no longer be a criminal offense. It is not the law's business, so said the Wolfenden Report. Mervyn Dickinson of the United Church of Canada said, The church should solemnize marriages between men. Now, that's a, that's a clergyman of the United Church of Canada. And by the way, he's not by himself, and the United Church of Canada is not by itself. In most of the leading Protestant denominations in America, a lax and accepting kind of position on homosexuality has been approved by the denomination in convention session. In New York City, the Homosexual League, and I hope you listen to everything I say because I can't help you if you don't, the Homosexual League in New York City polled 400, 300, 400, I think, 400 homosexuals and asked this question. Would you want to be cured if you could? Of the 400 who were polled, 96% of the homosexuals said they did not want to be cured. If they could be, they would want to remain as homosexuals. Dr. Irvin Bieber has made the statement that 27% can be cured. Now, this is what we face. May I say this, folks? These, these people are not... Or this sin is not limited to the crude and the beastly. Some of the greatest, uh, so-called greatest men in history were known homosexuals. 
I'll name you three or four. Plato. Leonardo da Vinci. Michelangelo. And probably Alexander the Great were homosexuals. These are just some. You see, homosexuality does not always associate itself with the beastly, dastardly, kind of open, wicked-looking things. It, it happens oftentimes in the ministry, in the medical profession, in, uh, in the legal profession. Uh, when I went to seminary, enrolled in seminary, did you know that any time a young man put down that he was going to be a ministerial student, they made a little note beside him to be sure and check carefully if he had any effeminate tendencies? That's where I quit doing this. And uh, did you know that, that uh, Maxine, go ahead and show that. It's there. That's not as good as I did it, but, uh, uh, but anyway, um, it creeps into all forms and all places of society. Now, I'm not going to ask you to use your Bibles tonight. I'm going to read for you. And the first verse I read is this. Thou shalt not lie with mankind as with womankind. It is abomination. Thou shalt not lie with mankind as with womankind. It is abomination. I read you another verse found in Leviticus also. If a man also lie with mankind as he lieth with a woman. Both of them have committed an abomination. They put to death. Their blood shall be upon them. We read a while ago a story in the 19th chapter of, of Genesis concerning the, the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. Two angels came to Sodom to tell Lot and his family about the coming destruction of the city. The city of Sodom, from which we get the word sodomy, was so given to homosexuality practices that when the men of Sodom heard that two angels were in Lot's house, they came and beat upon the doors of his house and begged for Lot to let those angels out so they could commit awful sin with those angels. Lot, who himself was wicked and, and, and backslidden, came out and said, Let me give you my daughters. I have two virgin daughters. Let me give you my daughters. And these men did not even want his daughters. They said, no, we want those angels. And the angels inside had distracted the men of Sodom blind, lest they come and assault them sexually. That's exactly why God destroyed the city of Sodom. I read for you another passage of Scripture found in Romans 1, who changed the truth of God into a lie, and worshipped and served the creature more than the Creator, who is blessed forever. Amen. For this cause God gave them up the vile affections, for even their women did change the natural use into that which is against nature, and likewise the men, leaving the natural use of the woman, burned in their lust one toward another, men with men, working that which is unseemly, and receiving in themselves which, with that recompense of their error which was meet. Now in verse 30, 32 it says, Who knowing the judgment of God, that they which, which commit such things are worthy of death, not only do the same, but have pleasure in them that do them. The Bible says the day will come, the day is coming, and the sin will be committed, when men will get with men, leaving the natural use of the woman, and commit sexual acts, men with men. The Bible says also, women with women will likewise commit the same sin. Of women leaving the natural use of the physical, and women with women committing <coughs> awful sin. Now, we face it. Now, the question is, what can we do about it? Now, that's what I want to talk to you tonight about, is what can we do about it? Now listen, it is not enough just to be saved. The first thing you must do about it is realize it could happen to your child. It could happen to your child. When that little baby is born, the first, one of the first things you ought to realize is that baby could become a homosexual. Experts say, and by the way, I'm not an expert, but I believe with all my heart, but experts say all babies at birth are potential homosexuals, and that no baby at birth is any more nearer homosexuality than any other baby, but that at birth all babies are equal. Now then, experts say it is entirely, now hear me, it is entirely up to the parents. It is entirely up to the parents. Now, the causes. And along with the causes, I'll give you some things that I think will help help you to avoid it. I've talked to hundreds of homosexuals. And by the way, they come clear. We've seen me, fellow sit over here one, one Sunday morning. 
after the service. He said, I want to talk with you. He came to my office and said, I have something to tell you. He said, I'm ashamed of it, but I must tell you, I am a homosexual. He said, I have been for years. I, I live, he said, I have a, I have a, a, a boyfriend. And I mean, like, like uh, uh, girls have boyfriends and boys have girlfriends, I have a boyfriend. And, uh, and, and I said, well, tell me. He said, we hold hands, we kiss, we drive out in the car and park and pet and neck. And, uh, and I have talked to many of them. Now, listen, there's some things that all of them have in common and some things that most of them have in common. And here's one. In almost every case, now, not every case, but in almost every case, there's the case of the mother babying a son. The mother babying a son. The mother overprotects the son. Now, you said, Brother Hiles, I wish you told me this years ago. Well, I, I'm sorry, I, I didn't know you years ago, but uh, I'm telling the folks this now that have little children. Now, mothers, you say what you want. Listen, I preached the other night in Tulsa on how to make a man out of a boy, and that ain't no easy sermon. <laughs> That's a mean one. And I said, mothers, quit calling your grown boys sweetheart and darling and sweetie face and honey child and baby. In fact, don't ever start it. That's why you give a boy a name, so call him. If your boy's named Tom, call him Tom. Don't call him baby, sweetie face, honey child. And I preached my fool head off on things like that. And uh, so a couple t- drove me down to the hotel room. There was a, a, a group from John Brown University had waited to interview me after the service and so I had to stay till almost at 12 o'clock, and the couple drove me down. And one of the, of the couple, one of the boys was a son of uh, uh, this couple, and he was going to John Brown University and was going back to university. So that after I'd preached for an hour and a half and about that, the mother kissed the boy goodbye and said, Goodbye, darling. Big 20-year-old boy. Goodbye, darling. Now, in almost every case, now, you'll, you, I'll help you if you'll let me. Well, you say, I just don't believe it. Okay, just just go ahead and be an idiot if you want to, but if you've got any sense, you're going to listen to somebody who knows what he's talking about. And not only do I believe this, but almost anybody who knows homosexuals well believes this. Overprotection by a mother is very serious. Um, psychologists say that, that when a mother, in such cases, <laughs> oftentimes, the mother has a secret love affair. Now, don't misunderstand that. Her heart love for the son. And the devotion that she really should have for her husband has been transferred to the son. And the son becomes the object of the mother's affection and the object of tender care that the mother should give to her husband, but she gives it to the son. And in almost every case of homosexuality among boys, there is a, an overly possessive mother who, uh, oh, brother, the, when the boy gets older even, he can't say anything for himself. The mother's got to say it for him. He can't go anywhere alone. The mother's got to go, go, go with him. And uh, uh, so this is dangerous. Now, mothers, uh, I know you've got a cute boy. I know he's the cutest thing in the nursery. But let him be a boy. Now, if you if, if you got a bunch of girls, put ribbon on them. But if you've got a boy, don't. If you've got a girl, put a, put a, a dress on her. But don't let me see that boy in a dress. You said, Brother House, what should a boy that's two months old wear? Let him wear two month size blue jeans. Not only that. Usually, in most of these cases, the father is either effeminate or too busy to spend time with the boy. Now listen carefully to this. In most cases, the father is either effeminate or too busy to spend time with the boy. Now, you say, preacher, what do you mean? I mean this. I, I think it's good to spend time with boys, but let me say this. A child, a homosexual tendencies come in a child a long time before he's in his teenage years. The most important years for a child to be around a real man are those early years. Far more important. It is more important that a child two years old have a he-man dad who spends time with him than a child 14 years old have a he-man dad who spends time with him. When a child is little and the, and, and the subconscious is forming and the impressions and the child is beginning to pick up mannerisms. Listen, how a child's going to walk is determined basically before he's in his teenage years. 
uh, the coordination of a child, how he handles his body, how he takes care, how he, how he walks, how he sits, how he moves his arms, and so forth. Um, th- those, those are care- That's why that in most cases, an overprotective mother and either an effeminate father or a masculine father who in the formative years of the child's life does not spend enough time with the child. I know, I'm thinking right now of a man in this church who is one of the most masculine men I know. When his boy was that high, I saw that boy developing feminine tendencies. That high. The man is busy. He's ever been a man. Masculine. But he did not spend enough time with that boy when he was a little tight. And the boy, for all practical purposes, walks like a girl, talks like a girl, and he's in our church, and I like him, except I'm scared to death about his future. Now, his dad's masculine, but the boy, in his formative years, did not associate himself enough with his dad and did not pick up masculine tendencies. What happened? He picked up, he saw his mother walk more than he did his father, and he walked like his mother. It is vitally important. That the mother not overly protect the child. And by all means, mother, don't substitute love that ought to be given and affection that ought to be given to your husband and give it to the son. Because, first place, you're robbing your husband. In the second place, you're going to ruin your um, There's something else about it, too. Homosexuals basically are lonely people. They're loners. They like to be alone, and before, if they do have any mixing and mingling, they love to gravitate to people who are, who are like themselves. So, here's a, here's a person who has a child, loves to be alone. He re, he's retiring. He loves to be alone. Doesn't love to be with, with heterosexual society. Doesn't like to mix and mingle. No, heterosex, I mean, I mean the, both sexes and, and, and crowds of people and so forth. He wants to retire. I, listen. I have never met a homosexual that didn't spend hours musically. Jeremy, I'm not against music, but I'm against spending too much time with it. I have never met a homosexual that didn't spend hours musically. Now, he or she may not have been able to, um, to play or to sing, but they could play the stereo. And 90% of the cases of homosexuals with whom I talk... I ask them, do you have a stereo, and do you spend hours with it? And they say, yeah. The boys do. The girls say, yeah. Um, so, um, I'm just telling you what I found and what other, oh, other experts <laughs> what, what experts say, and that is that homosexuals are usually lonely people. They want to be alone. They gravitate to others like themselves. Now then, let me give you a few <coughs> suggestions under that that will help you. One, when your baby is born, take him to the nursery. You're off on the wrong foot, mothers, when you bring that little boy in your arm. Now, you listen to me. Don't you, don't bristle. Just set up and take your medicine like a good little lady. You, you bring that little boy in your arm to the church service when you ought to be in the nursery. Because the nursery is too dirty. Now, I've got news for you. I've been in your home. And our nursery is a health club compared to most of your homes. Your kid can fall, can crawl on the floor at home and, and, and play with a dog and lick the dog's feet. I know, I've seen you. Not you, but the kids. I've seen some of you almost worse than that, kiss him in the mouth, like I said this morning. More I think about that. I'd rather kiss Dr. Billings in the mouth than a cocker spaniel. No, let me think about that. Let me think about that. I, uh, uh, I, I'd like to have some more time to consider that. Now, when your, ba- when your baby is born, don't be afraid to put the baby with people. Stick the baby in the nursery. You say, he cries. Oh, can't let him cry. Oh, I heard him. Put him in the nursery. Put him in the nursery. I'm saying boys and girls, too. Put them in the nursery. Let them get used to being with people. Let them get used to being away from mama and away from daddy and mix and mingle in society. It's vitally important. Vitally important. Second suggestion is this. Let them be with other children. 
it is important that children it is important that children are with other children. Vitally important. Now, I don't mean that, uh, that in the neighborhood you ought to run around the wrong crowd. But that's one of the good things about Sunday school. That's one of the good things about coming to a church like this. You put your kid over here in our nursery. Our nursery. We have good nurseries. But you put him, not only this, uh, you'll teach him a child in our toddler's nursery, for example. Not only will you teach him to be with other people, you'll teach him self-defense and, <laughs> and survival of the fittest and, and other things. And it's not bad for him. I won't tell you who this is, wouldn't dare. But there's a man in our church whom I admire tremendously. His boy goes to a certain school in this area. His boy is not the most masculine boy in the world. This man made his boy go out for a, for a sport. And the boy is not really by nature good at the sport. And so he quit. And the dad said, you're going to go back and go out for the sport. But the boy said, I'll be hurt. And the dad said, good. You're going to go out for the sport. I'm going to make you go out for it. And the boy went back and he's getting his nose blooded and everything else. But he's got to go out. And the dad said, if you don't go out for the sport, you're no longer welcome in my home. There you go, you women, shocked. That's the trouble with you right now. Overprotect and over shelter. I had two or three ladies that had seizures when I said that. <coughs> now, I'm saying this, I don't know how how I don't know if the man started early enough with his son, but if he didn't start early enough, he's certainly handling it right now. Teach the children to be with other children. Put them in the nursery. Have them in a church like this. Let them mix and mingle with a heterosexual society where they can be with girls and boys in, a, in crowds. It's vitally important. Vitally important. Uh, another suggestion. And that is, now this is the most important thing I've said, I think, and that is let your children have hobbies that involve or require groups. <coughs> Now, I'm going to say this. I, I hope you won't misunderstand me. You know what I want for our young people. And you know I don't want our young people getting in wrong crowds and misbehaving with girls and boys. But I'll tell you what. This problem right here is 10,000 times greater than that problem. This problem of homosexuals, and it's caused not by schools, it's caused not by the Supreme Court. Here's a problem not caused by the leftist. Here's a problem not caused by the communist. Here's a problem not caused by Hollywood. Here's a problem caused by you. You. Sitting right here tonight, you're the ones that caused this problem. You can't point to anybody else and say, Oh, our country is going to the devil because of so-and-so. No, in this case, it's going to the devil because of you. Now, they say this, and I, and, and I know I'll make somebody mad. I don't want to. I want to be a help, and God knows I do, but I've got to be frank if I'm a help. It is far more important that your child learn to play basketball, football, or volleyball, group activities, and so forth. Girls, it is far more important that your child do it than your child spend all of his time practicing the piano, the flute, playing pool by himself in the basement. A lady, lady came to talk to me several years ago. I said, Pastor, I'm concerned about my boy. And I know of at least a hundred people in this room that have pool tables in the basement. Personally, I, I don't think a pool table is the best thing in the world to own. I don't think, think you sin if you have one. I just, I just don't think it's the best thing in the world to own. Uh, one reason I don't play pool is I lost so much money at it through the years. But I, uh, I um, <laughs> personally, I mean, I just rather use dice. But anyway, uh, I, uh, now please don't go away and say, say I, I throw dice. I'm kidding. Everybody understand that? All right. But, um, this lady came to me and said, I'm, I'm worried about my son. I said, I am too. I am too. 
I said, I'm going to tell you a few things about it. I don't know it, but I'm going to guess. I said, in the first place, he's retiring. She said, yes. I said, now, this. Don't buy him anything that he can play or do alone now. And, and she said, oh, my. I just got him a pool table. Now, nothing wrong. Yeah, maybe there is. But I'm not, I'm not a preaching against pool tables. I do think that it should be something he cannot do alone. For example, ping pong is better than pool. It is almost impossible to play ping pong by yourself. <coughs> you see, <coughs> tennis is better than a stereo. Now, I'm not against stereos. I love stereo music. I could listen to it myself uh, for hours and hours. I don't, but I could. I like it. But when I was a kid, I did not even know that there was such a thing as stereo. And probably there wasn't. I thought a record when I was a kid was the biggest crowd you ever had before. That's all I knew about records. Uh, I knew exactly how much a basketball weighed, and I knew exactly how much a football weighed, and I knew exactly how far I could hit a, hit, a, hit a baseball and a softball, and I knew every vacant lot in town, and everywhere I went, every, every, every place I ever lived, we had every vacant lot had a pass, from a diamond pass. Remember? I, I, I still, sorry, still feel sorry for these uh, little leaguers. To me, you haven't lived. You play ball in a vacant lot. Break out a few windows of the lady's house next door and run for your life. Knock the ball over her backyard. And, oh, good night. And she comes, ah, oh, get that ball. And you jump over the fence right quick and get it and run for your life and pray that the shot will hit somebody else instead of you. God pity this, this modern generation of kids. But it is vital that children, that they mix and mingle with society as little children. If your child retires and pulls away from society, then your child is, is starting toward tendencies that accompany almost every homosexual that I ever met. Group sports. I'm not opposed to a boy playing the piano if it's a secondary thing in his life. I'm not opposed to a boy playing a musical instrument if he doesn't spend all his time practicing on it and if it's secondary. But any boy that is delighted... To play, to, to play a musical instrument or to practice solo work, voice, anything. Any boy that's delighted to do that when, and can look out the window and see a ball game going on in the vacant lot without griping about it is in trouble. Group activities, group hobbies are vitally important. Next thing, teach your boys to be around real men. Real men. By all means, get your boys around real men. That's one reason why every person in this church, hear me, every person in this building tonight who has a family and goes to a church where a pastor is not obviously, outwardly, and considered by all to be a masculine man, you ought to move your membership tonight. Now, I'm not kidding. I don't care if he's the best preacher in this county. If he's, if he's not masculine, your boy shouldn't be watching him. Get your boy around real men. Dr. Billings knows this is true. I reckon I'll tell that story. You think it's safe? You won't be embarrassed. All right. <laughs> well, don't, listen, if you are, don't hit me with your purse when the service is over now. <laughs> but um, anyway... There was a, I think I'll tell you, think we ought to have a conference about this? You'll trust me. We have an application to teach in our school. The, uh, he, he is a young man that we wanted and needed. Dr. Billings suggested we hire him. I was on the way to the airport and got my files out, looking through, and I saw a picture of the fella. And the first thought I had was, it looks sissy. First thought I had. Now, just a picture of his face, bust, bust picture, you know. But there's something about the smile that bothered me, you know. And uh, it just bothered me. And so I... Um, now, now Do Dr. Billings has a right to hire and fire... Uh, with, with, well, with, with the approval of the our deacon board, uh, faculty, uh, except the coach 
and the Bible teachers and the assistant principal, if we ever hire one. Now, those I interview too. But this fellow was not in those departments, and I did not normally interview. Most of these teachers I didn't interview. But um, I, I came back and I told Dr. Billings, I said, I'm concerned about this fellow. Dr. Billings said, well, he's already been here. We came to see you. You're out of town, and he's already gone back to another state. <coughs> and uh, he said, I, I, I think he's all. I said, I said, what's your first impression? When you first saw him, what did you think? He said, my first thought was, he's a little bit sissy. But he said, after that, I got to realize that he wasn't. So, uh, I called my daughter Becky, who had worked at the school this summer, and I said, Becky, adopt this fellow. What do you think about him? And she said, oh, he's a good guy. I like him. Thank God to hire him. I said, what was the first impression you had when you first looked at him? And she said, well, Dad, my first impression was he was a little bit sissy. But I found out later that he wasn't. It's just the way he looked. So, I asked one other person that, and they had the same impression. So I um, had Dr. Biddings bring him all the way back from another state, hundreds of miles, he came. I talked with him for a few minutes, and my first impression was the same impression I had the picture, uh, when I saw the picture. And I looked him right in the eyeball, and I said, uh, young fellow, I'm going to tell you something that will help you if you'll let it. I'm the best friend you've got right now. I said, either you're the baby or the only son. And I said, your mother and dad favored you and are prouder of you than any of the kids. And I said, you have spent most of your life practicing something alone. And you're good at it, and it has consumed your life. And I said, when you were in school, when they chose sides to play ball, you were the last one chosen, and you played right field all the time. Remember that time? And I said, you made good grades in school, and all the real regular guys hated your insides. Remember that kind? You know, who the kind that walked down the hall? <laughs> and, and every time the teacher asked a question, his hand was always up, answering it. We wanted to stick him with a pen, and usually did. By the way, you school teachers make some kids like that by honoring them above the fellows who are he men. Now, I'll say a word to our school teachers as superintendent of school. I want to say a word to our school teachers in our, in our high school. You will do harm to a fellow you honor because he has those tendencies, but is not a real man. So... This, this young fellow looked at me and he said, you, sir, are a prophet. He said, the truth is, here's the story of my life. I am the pet child and the youngest child. I am my mother and dad's favorite. I did spend more time with mother than dad. I did play an instrument and practiced it day and night. I did play right field and was the last one chosen. And then he looked at me and he said, Sir, you are one of the greatest men I ever met in my life. That's what he said. He said, If someone had told me years ago what you told me today, I wouldn't be like this now. Now he said, I don't want to teach in your school. This is to his everlasting credit. I don't want to teach in your school. He said, I, I, I don't know where I'll teach. It's too late to sign a contract anywhere else. I have wanted to teach here. But he said, if I taught here, he said, you'd watch me walking down the street, and I'd see you, and I'd start walking like this. <laughs> now, he said, I'm going to lick my problem. But he said, I can't lick it around you. But he looked at me, and he said, you have done more for me today and probably you'd ever realize. And he said, the trip that I've taken from my distant state has been one of the most important trips I ever took in my life. Now, it's advice. Now, you say, Brother Howes, was he, was he a, a homosexual? I don't think so. Except, and I think he was a, probably a, a pretty nearly a man. But, 
He couldn't put a sign on him and say, after you know me three days, I'll, I'll be more manly. That's why it's vital a boy walk like a boy, sit like a boy, hold his body like a boy, have coordination like a boy. Vitally important. That's why a boy ought to be around men, he men, masculine men. He ought to be around, and he ought to be around him in the formative years of his life. Another thing, a boy ought to be taught to sweat and work while he's a kid. I mean sweat. I mean perspire. But I mean, what is a little bit of tight? You don't know what sweating is. Hard work is. I'm thinking now of a homosexual, an adult. Had, had, had enough sense to come to me and ask for my help. And, he, and I said, what you, he said, what? he said, what should I do? And I said, get rid of that stereo. Now, I'm not saying everybody ought to do it, but in his case, he worshipped the crazy thing. Get rid of it! And I said, go down in, to some athletic place and, and, uh, and, 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 and work out. And I said, dig ditches, get you a job digging ditches, but be sure every day of your life you sweat! Vital. It's vital. Sweat and work. And then, of course, along the same line, masculine activities. It's also vital that a, uh, that a boy be taught early in life proper coordination. Proper coordination. It is also vital that a boy be taught, hear me now, and don't miss this, because I want you to be sure and spread this right on the telephone tomorrow morning. A boy ought to be taught to fight. Don't shake your head this way to me. I'll point you out. You'll have to fight yourself or prove you're a pacifist before it's over. You want to shake your head like that when I say, boy, go outside. We, we pay the rent here. We pay the building here. The light bill's here. Now, if you're going to be an uh, anarchist, go outside and, and get with the hippies, but not here. Toss a fight! Yeah, fight! These long-haired, stinking pacifists <laughs> setting America down the road to destruction. Many of them have grown up in silk and satin at the feet of wealthy people, have never perspired a day's day in their life, never had a hard job. And the truth is, we turned out better men when our boys had to milk the cows and shuck the corn and stack the hay high in the barn. But this this uh, busy uh, life of ours with, with, with boys having to grow up on concrete, Dr. Bill Rice said, when, when David was, I guess, nine or ten years of age, Dr. Bill Rice gave David a, a horse. A horse. Now, where are you going to put a horse? In Munster. I thought about it in the barn behind the house, but no place to put a horse. We got that crazy horse, good-sized Shetland pony, brought her up here, named her Princess, used the folks' house across the street. And David had a horse. I can see him now, 20 below zero. Snow on the ground, been there 14 years. David carrying a bucket of water in one hand, freezing as he went, and carrying a uh, sack in the other hand, going to feed the horse. Two o'clock in the morning, the phone had rang, and they said, this is the Munster Police Department. Reverend, your horse is loose again. <laughs> they said, go track down the crazy thing. That's how I learned the lasso. And uh, bring the horse in. Bring the horse in. He said, but the house, well, that's terrible. Yeah, that's terrible. But my boy knows how to ride a horse. You know the average boy in this church thinks a horse gives milk? <laughs> sort of sad, isn't it? Really, just it's sort of sad. A boy ought to have masculine activities, very vital. And he ought to be taught to fight. He ought to be taught to defend himself. He ought to be taught the manly art of self-defense. He ought to be the kind of fellow, when he gets married and has a family, that his family can feel secure if he's there. And by the way, he ought to be able to feel secure if he's there, too.
Keep people oftentimes saying to me, there's a house down here where it's dark and everything. Now, watch me. I'll get beat up tonight for saying this. But you should have stayed down here at the church where it's dark and all these people. Well, good. No, I don't plan to get beat up. Uh, tell, these, tell these hippies. People these say, all these hippies hanging around here with the house. Aren't you scared? I said, but man, they ought to be scared. I'm hanging around here. <laughs> now, I'm no great shakes of a, of a, of a, of a man, but I tell you one thing. I'm not scared. And when I walk out that door over there in, and late at night, you know what? I, I've got, last night I walked out a little late, and I had my Dixon machine, and I had it in the swinging position. And then I'd practice a little bit down the hall what I was going to do. Now, in case you decide to lay for me, mark it down. I've been laying for you, too. I'm a little tired of this. Turn the other cheek. Turn the other cheek. Now, I believe that we should not, when people do unkind things and try to hurt us, we ought not to be retaliatory. But when people are trying to do harm to our bodies and the bodies of those whom we love, I think we ought to have our boys trained to clobber them. Pacifists. I was down in Springfield, Missouri, and I made a statement, something like this, and six preachers walked up, and, and one said to me, he said, Reverend Howes, he said, he said, uh, what, do you, what do you do when the Scripture says resist not evil? And I said, what do you do with it? He said, I believe it. And, and all the other five fellows said, amen. <laughs> and uh, so um, I said, does that mean that you don't believe in retaliation? He said, no, we're pacifists. I said, you mean that if, if I hit you right now in the mouth and busted your lip, blooded your nose, you wouldn't hit back? He said, no. I said, good. He said, we're leaving. <laughs> now, you know, you know one reason why America doesn't defend herself? We haven't got anybody in shape enough to do it. I just thank God I was a paratrooper in World War II. Now, I didn't thank God then. But I thank God a long time before that. When I was a kid on the school ground, if anybody ever attacked me, I just sort of felt led to reciprocate. And I was always a runt. And I was always at the bottom of the heap. <laughs> and my reach wasn't very long. And, 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 and I wasn't very muscular, but I could claw and knee and bite. And by the way, I, were, I had it figured out a long time ago. If those hippies attack me, I know how to pull hair. <laughs> Teach your boy to fight. Now, you'll forgive me, and, and, I, and I know a lot of you folks don't understand this kind of talk, but you'll wish you did someday. You'll forgive me. But uh, when I come to your house, Cal, Brother Cal, forgive me. When I come to your house, and little Cal, if, if you said, little Cal, show Brother House what you can do. He stands up and he says, Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me I won't bring him home. So, or uh, you say, look out, tell, show the house what you can do. And he gets out a flute and plays the flute. Now, that's okay. Or even show the house how you can shake hands. Now, now I'll be honest with you. That, it, to me... If you put on boxing gloves and said, show the house, you're right cross to the chin. Now, that just impressed me more. I'm sorry. That's just how carnal I am. Another suggestion is, and, and, and I've said this before many times, show the boy manly affection. Now, I, I hope you won't <laughs> misunderstand this. But, you know, I just don't like to hug men much. Now, ladies, but I mean men... Uh, I just don't like to hug them much. Now, I, uh, I, I have some preacher brethren across the country. <clears throat> Dr. Bob Gray's one. 
had to hug this man Irish all my life. Now, nothing wrong with him. But he just hugs. You know, I never like to hug him. He don't smell good. <coughs> he, uh, he, uh, and, and, and he puts his, his face against mine and, and it sticks my, his beard sticks my chin and my, my cheek. And, uh, now, I, I'll be honest with you. I think it's a danger to teach our boys to get physically close to males. I think it's a lot better to do away with a lot of the hugging and the kissing, especially for ladies kissing their sons too much. Now, I'm not, I'm not saying you shouldn't kiss the boy goodbye when he, if the boy goes on a six months tour of Alcatraz, kiss him goodbye when he goes. But every time he goes to the store, you don't have to kiss him goodbye and slobber on him. To me, I can recall when I was a kid to this day, I can recall ever old, I'd go to family reunions, and ever old fat lady in the whole family would want to kiss me, and there's nothing as discouraging as seeing a, 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 your little kid, seeing a couple of ladies' lips all perked up, coming at you, it's just downright dis- disconcerting and discouraging. And there's no need in it! Now, I'm for affection, but I'm not for, I'm not for boys growing up being taught to hug all the boys. Now, we face a problem. We do. You, you can accept it or reject it, like it or not. You say, I don't know what I'm talking about, or, or I do. Whatever you want to say, but if you will heed some of the things I've said tonight, it could well, might not, save your boy, or maybe even your girl. Now, the problem is greater among boys, but it's prevalent among girls. I want you young folks, I want, your, I want the little babies in the nursery. By the way, tonight, as I walked over here, I, uh, I prayed as I walked by. God, help me to help some of those kids in that, those beds tonight. And I pray that it will help some of your unborn children, even. I want them to have full lives and everything that is rightly theirs. And I know of nothing that will cause them to forfeit any more than for them to get involved in homosexuality. And there never has been a generation in the history of this nation where the temptations to homosexuality were as prevalent as they are tonight. 